Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the latest of our National Botanic Gardens afternoon lectures. You're all very welcome. Uh, today we have Paul Fitters from the Chagas College of Amenity Horticulture, uh, who shares a campus with us here in the National Botanic Gardens. And Paul is going to talk about rewilding, which is very exciting. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, when he's not with us, Paul is usually found uh, teaching ecology and beekeeping, amongst other things, which is all very interesting. Um, and before I hand over to him, um, I would just like to tell you a little bit about our other upcoming lectures. Um, so next week, the 31st of March, also at three o'clock, we have a media, uh, excuse me, um, a lecture from the National Museum of Ireland, having a whale of a time at Dublin Zoo, where Paolo Viscardi and Karen van Dorp are going to tell us about um, when they had to recently take down the blue whale skeleton. And there's a really interesting link with the Botanic Gardens there, which I think you'll find interesting. The following week, then, the 7th of April, 3 o'clock, we have another one from the National Museum of Ireland. We love the National Museum of Ireland. Um, Nigel Monaghan is going to talk about art, artists and art uh, in the National History section. Then the 14th of April, uh, 3 o'clock, Maria Long from the National Parks and Wildlife Service is going to talk about grasslands, hidden in plain sight, amazing semi-natural grasslands, which is going to be really interesting. And then the 21st of April, um, also Wednesday, three o'clock, we have Lee Davies, who's the Fungarium curator at Kew Gardens in London. He's gonna to talk to us about mushrooms. Your cousin is a mushroom and they're more important than you know. So um, just to mark your card for those lectures if you're interested in them. And then a quick little bit of um, housekeeping. If you're familiar with Crowdcast now, you'll know you can put your comments down the side like a lot of these um, uh, packages. And if you ask a question, you can put it down the bottom. A uh, question's a little bit different than a comment because uh, I can look at those and you can upvote questions if you see somebody else uh, asking what you want to ask. And then when Paul is finished, I'll go through those questions and put them to Paul. And my colleague Kira is in the comments there helping out uh, if there's any issues uh, with connect connectivity and that kind of thing. So I think that's everything. Um, Paul's going to talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll take some questions. So I think at that point, uh, you've seen enough of me. I'm going to hand over to Paul. So thanks, Paul. Okay, thank you very much, Lynn, uh, for the introduction. And uh, I'm just going to straight away call up my presentation. Uh, and start talking about it. Is the presentation up? Mm, oh, yeah, one second. I got to focus it. And it's up. And it's up. Very good. Okay. Um, yes, I called my uh, talk Dare to be Wild. It's all about rewilding and then what you can do in your own garden to... Um, you can go wild too in your own garden and that will help biodiversity. And this is a picture of the, the west of Ireland. Uh, I tend to go to the west of Ireland if I'm allowed uh, pre-COVID uh, on a holiday. And you go to these fantastic scenes in Connemara or the Burren and they're effectively wild and they're just spectacular. There's lots to see and there is not a gardener in sight. You don't have to go that far. You can go to forests and, um, and for instance, here, a lovely one with bluebells. Um, and very often, say in Glendalough, you walk around and you... I, I find it very restful to go around in, uh, in forest and to see things like that. And again, there's not a gardener inside. And if I, I am, I'm an avid gardener, I love gardening and I love to try any plant I can get my hands on. Um, but I'm forever fighting nature to give my plants that I plant a chance to do well. So I'm weeding and I'm digging and I'm moving. And, uh, and sometimes I wonder, am I mad fighting with nature all the time? Um, why not go with nature and uh, like in the pictures here and, uh, and it's, it's very restful and it can be extremely stunning. Now, as Glenn said, I am teaching biodiversity or ecology or both really in, in uh, the Chagas College. And um, for my subject, when I was reading, I came across a book from Isabella Tree and she is, uh, together with her husband, the owner of Nap Estate in the UK, and they, she wrote a book about wilding. And it, that was really in 2000 for me, the, the book that made the most impact on me in that year. And 
to tell you a bit about it, if you haven't heard about it, um, the, the NEP estate is an estate of 3,500 acres and it's in West Sussex. And they, uh, they, her husband inherited the, the estate and uh, generation before him, they were uh, farming the estate like most estates, they are massive farms effectively. And they're not in the best of soil, it's kind of heavy clay soil. And for years, they're trying to improve the production by more fertilizers, more chemical sprays, uh, more intense farming, more equipment. And so the cost was spiraling and the profits were not coming in to make, make it even. And uh, effectively, some years they were making a loss. And they were really thinking, God, is this the way to go? And in 2001, they decided to give it all up and uh, start this highly exciting rewilding project. And what they did is effectively they um, sold all their cattle and all their uh, animals, stopped plowing the fields for grain and maize and whatever they were growing, and um, put a massive fence around the whole estate and took the internal fences away. And the, the project is about rewilding to see, can nature uh, come back into places like that and um, without intervention. Now, normally when there is a, um, when people are doing conservation, very often they find an animal that's quite rare and then it's, trying to keep the habitat that the rare animal is in uh, as pristine as possible. So with that one species in mind. The difference here is that they um, took the whole estate as a rewilding project with no actual aim other than increasing biodiversity and uh, letting the animals do their thing. Now they didn't take all the animals away totally. They, instead of the cows that they had, they introduced um, other animals. Um, and for instance, this is a longhorn cattle. Uh, this is the domesticated longhorn cattle, but it's the closest to a wild animal that still exists and is possible to have in the UK. And they released them in the estate. And here you can see them in the front lawn, <laughs> probably when they were just re uh, released near the house of Nepa State. Then they also released uh, more deer. There was already deer in the estate, but they released more species of it. And then they released the Dartmoor pony, which is effectively a horse that is as closest to the wild horses that used to roam in the UK. And those animals were let loose. They were not fed, they were not taken in in winter, and they were not medicated in any way. So they had to self-medicate, they had to protect themselves and go to places to hide. And um, they just had to fend for themselves. And what happened is that they did that very well and they started to reproduce. And amazing things started to happen on the estate. Um, another thing they released was the Thamesworth pig, as you can see here and that's the closest to the wild boar that you can release. Now the, the horses and the deer, uh, they are there to graze, but they also disturb the land a bit, which gives more habitats really. And, uh, and they nibble on all kinds of plants and keeps loads of areas open that otherwise would become a forest. And the one thing that they're missing in Nepa State is the beaver. And um, and they're hoping to introduce it now, unless I missed it in the last year that they did, but they were really trying hard to be able to release the beaver because the beaver is a major, uh, it's a, um, a, a keystone species. And a keystone species, it means that uh, one animal has an improportionate uh, effect on the environment relative to its number. So a few, beavers would make a huge impact that would create dams and change the, the direction of the river really and uh, creates wetlands and that has a huge impact for biodiversity. So the beaver is a keystone species that they like to introduce and for the moment they have just been uh, doing the work for the beaver themselves um, and that's not really the same. 
the upshot of the rewilding and at below is a, is, a, is a website that you can go to where there are some fantastic videos of it, of the owners talking. The upshot of the rewilding project was beyond their imagination. Not only did all the animals do well and multiply, they also changed the whole landscape. The whole landscape became far more varied. Um, uh, the insect numbers exploded, the number of plants exploded the number of different species and uh, as a result of that uh, the number of birds increased there was a cascade really of an effect of of all kinds of animals in the estate and that in turn attracted more birds from further afield um, so the whole project has been very successful for them and as a result of that now they have hundreds of nightingales uh, breeding in the estate which which are not that uh, usual in the uk they have the purple emperor um, butterfly which is the biggest butterfly in the uk and they have the highest population i think in nap seemingly it's an aggressive butterfly that can chase away birds and finally they have the turtle dove which is I think everybody, uh, at least in the English speaking language, knows because of the, um, um, the, the Christmas song, uh, uh, Three Turtle Doves, so or I don't know what the number is, but anyway, about the turtle dove. Everybody knows about it, but hardly anybody sees that bird because they're really quite shy and there are not that many around. So they have, and this is just a small um, selection of animals that have done very well, extremely well. The one thing that they are missing in NEP is predators, top predators. Because if they wouldn't do anything to all the deer and the, and the horses and the, uh, the cattle, then they would keep on reproducing and then they would overgraze and then the bi biodiversity will go down. So naturally in any environment, you need a top predator to keep those animals the numbers in check. So what they've done in NAP is they started culling the top predators uh, and selling them as uh, organic meat, wild meat. And they also have started a, um, a glamping, camping, safari kind of business. And hundreds of people are flocking to NAP to see uh, wildness in its true form. And the interesting thing is that um, wildness in england is when you let nature take control it doesn't mean it's gone becoming a forest the the the, the original idea about uh, england is that it was totally forested when it was totally wild uh, it's probably not true we probably it would probably move more look like a savanna like a an open mixed landscape and that is because of all the animals uh, how they behave and what they do um in the in the Netherlands, where I'm from, there was a rewilding project as well before NEP. Uh, effectively, it started and it's called the Oostvaarder Plasse. And there they had an area slightly smaller than NEP where they let go of horses and deer and all kinds of things as well. And there weren't any predators either. And they let the numbers go too high. And then a lot of animals died in winter when there wasn't enough to eat. And there was a lot of controversy over it. While in NAP, they have managed it very well, I think. Um, and they, they are now leading in, in biodiversity and uh, they're really making an impact on how biodiversity uh, can be improved. Now, the, the one thing that they, um, that they found out is uh, it's, it's called the shifting baseline syndrome. And the shifting baseline syndrome is the gradual change in accepted norms for the condition of the natural environment due to a lack of past experience or information. And it's a mouthful. Um, shifting baseline syndrome is effectively a persistent downgrading of the perceived normal. And what it, what it means is that we all look at what is normal based on our experience when we were young 
Um, but if we then look at our grandparents, they might look at their experience when they were young and it might have been far more biodiverse. The shifting baseline syndrome has been um, highlighted by Daniel Pauly. It's a French um, scientist who works in the fishery and the marine industry. And he assessed that, for instance, in the 1800s, there was far, far more biodiversity in the sea than there was in the 1950s. And in 2020, there is far less. But anybody born in, say, 2000 will take the 2000 baseline as their norm, as their normal, because that's what they grew up with and that was normal. While with each generation, um, there is a bit, um, the, the expectation is less. So you're eroding away, you're downgrading the perceived normal. And effectively, that's where we are now. We are really looking at, at, at nature and we think we know what nature did look like in the past and biodiversity wise, but we probably haven't got a clue. And I think NEP showed that, NEP estate, because um, they didn't, they wanted to increase biodiversity by a little bit, and they were hit by how many animals appeared, how many, uh, the numbers increased, how much more uh, biomass there was, um, and, and, and biodiversity. And I think we're just underestimating what nature can do and what nature can go back to. Um, I came across this slide, which I love. Um, and this is just more recent. And some of you probably will relate to it. Um, I was there in 2000 and, and before a bit. And I remember wind screams of cars were always full of insects in summer. That was a, a bit of a pain having to wipe them all off all the time. However, in 2020, um, there isn't much insects anymore. Your windscreens aren't as dirty as they used to be. But my kids that are around 20 years of age now, they would probably not think twice of it. That is their norm. Yeah, so that's the shifting baseline syndrome. They haven't got a clue that um, the insect population has enormously collapsed over the last 10, 20 years, or perhaps even over the last 40 years. Um, because their baseline is different. So that's, we have to think slightly differently. Now, I come to the back garden. This could be your garden, my garden. Now, it isn't my garden, it's just a picture from the web. But um, you might think, fine and well, I don't have 3,500 acres to play with. I can't release. I have a postage stamp garden like here, and uh, I can't release pigs and horses and all these things. So what can I do? What's the point in doing anything? Um, and I asked myself the same question. I, I calculated it. I have 0.07% of what they have in NAP. I have one acre and I feel very rich with my one acre. I'll show you some pictures later. But um, wh what can you do? Would it make an impact? And the thing is, yes, it will make an impact. The reason your garden can make an impact is that it's part of corridors. And this is a picture of Dublin, part of Dublin. Um, and you can see that there are green patches everywhere. And the whole idea about corridors is that they will con connect with core nature reserves. So for instance, Nep or, or in the case Burren or the Phoenix Park, you have all these big green areas, relatively big, that can have a good bit of biodiversity. And then you have all these little gardens that might connect into another park. And the corridors are perceived to be very, very important for survival of many species. Um, and gardens, in that case, can help an awful lot. It's also road verges, but it's also gardens. And gardens roughly account for one third of the surface of cities. Now, it depends a bit where you live. You might be a bit more lucky or a bit less, but uh, roughly a third of the, the surface area can is gardens. So in other words, that's a huge area that can add in biodiversity. Um, I put a picture in of the tree. Um, two years ago, that was a big issue with the, the corridors that they were, the core bus corridors that they were making. And they were taking, they were 
proposing to take loads of trees down. And I was ferociously against it uh, because that is effectively minimizing the, the, the corridor function of certain areas uh, because there's less biodiversity and they were also threatening to take loads of front gardens away as well. So corridors are very important and um, so your garden can do can be important for biodiversity too and the question is of course what can you do and the first thing I'm thinking of what you can do is um, have more uh, plants for bees we know bees are important for pollination and there is there was a big decline in bees and in order to uh, have bees working well they need to be fed all year round except for winter when they're in their hive or in their burrows whatever they are um, and there needs to be nectar sources for bees the beekeeping in towns have has increased quite a lot because um, towns are often more biodiverse flower wise um, and a bit warmer than the countryside so in other words there's there's lots of different plants to get nectar and pollen from but one thing you can do if you have a garden is to have different kinds of plants that flower at different times of the year. Especially the early ones are important, so early spring and late autumn when other sources might be running out, it's great to have plants for those areas. I love this time of the year, I hope you do too, especially when the sun is out, the bumblebees are already out, I have loads of daffodils, I have loads of dandelions are beginning to come, um, I have um, pulmonaria, longworth, flowering. It really is beginning to explode and the insects are instantly uh, reacting to it. Now, it's, so it's good to have different things. It's also good, and that's one thing I want to point out here, not just to think about small plants. A few crocuses is fine, but one sycamore tree is far more, uh, in volume wise, far more important than a few uh, crocuses in your lawn. So a uh, lime tree, a sycamore tree, have one or two big trees can make a huge difference for the bees. And here is the bee, the solitary, uh, the, 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 the honey bee, and a bit of ivy as well, which provides nectar and pollen in winter. Now we have in Ireland um, 100 or, or 98 bee species. Uh, many are solitary bees. Um, and the solid, this is, for instance, the leaf cutter bee. Um, we have 77 solitary bees. We have about 20 bumblebee species. And here's a bumblebee nest in the ground. Uh, I've come across one or two in my garden. Generally, they're well hidden. But if you sit down and just watch where they go, you might find one. And very often, they're underneath a hedge. And then there is also the, the mason bees that where is my last one? Yeah, that make nests in walls and things like that. So you'd like to stimulate um, bees really for, for pollination. And you could, for instance, help them by having a solitary bee observation box. You can make a bee hotel that works fine for the solitary bees but uh, and some masonry bees. But some bees won't nest in it. Not all of them will use it. But again, it's, it's helpful to some. The masonry bees will nest in a box like this and you can open up the site and you can look inside and you can see. So here are the actual bees. I wonder if they're put in for the picture, but uh, and then at the end they uh, lay an egg and put a, a, a batch of food in it and then seal it off and then make another pouch with another egg. So each row will be filled with solitary bees. Uh, eggs and then when they hatch they come out and start make their own so this is a lovely way of um, seeing that you have them and checking them out how well they're doing another thing that you can do in your own garden is um, be messier um, tidiness is effectively the enemy of biodiversity um, so i know we all like our tidy lawns and our clipped hedges and things like that. But really, every time you tidy, you are disturbing a bit, but you might even take uh, habitats away. And for instance, dead trees are great habitat for loads of fungi and beetles and all kinds of insects. So 
if you have a tree that dies, you might just leave the stump. Now, that mightn't be everybody's cup of tea, and if you have a small garden, that's not really what you want. But you could throw a rose over it and let it be smothered by a rose and still have all the dead wood dying back. You can also alternatively cut the tree down and use the tree trunks to make a raised bed rather than have hard landscaping. Now it becomes a habitat for all kinds of little critters that can go in and in between. This is a picture of my own garden. I had an arch and the top came off and it was rotted away. And then I decided to stick in all my little pruning branches from the trees that I was taking down anyway. The bigger ones went for the fire and the smaller ones were stuck in there. Um, it looks spectacular, I think, in the first year. I was very pleased. <laughs> the whiteness disappears, the wood shrinks a bit when it dries up, and now they started to fall out. But in the meantime, the climber has grown over it and it's still looking quite nice. This is a picture I found on the web where somebody creatively painted or burned, I don't know exactly how they did it, uh, a lovely pattern on a dead tree. Uh, and then that's how you can make a nice um, piece of art from it. And if any of you live in Dublin, uh, I can see fantastic uh, people coming from miles away uh, attending this lecture, but some of you probably live in Dublin. And if you go to Bull Island, and if you come out of Bull Island, uh, just opposite the road, there's a tree trunk that they carved into a beautiful sculpture. And that's another thing you can do. Here's some more examples of uh, things you can do with um, wood, make a pavement or have a traditional stompery. Uh, effectively, it's just all the tree trunks thrown in a corner, loads of ferns. Uh, and that's, again, a great habitat for biodiversity. And finally, you could also make it into, um, no, word's not coming to me, uh, fairy houses at the base of tree trunks whether it's alive or dead, really, uh, it's another way of dealing with it. Okay, so you can have, uh, you can, you need to be a bit more messy and you need to leave things fallen down uh, for critters to go into. Uh, the lawn is another thing that most people have and most people mow it on a regular basis. And that is something that hopefully is something of the past at some point, because you can make it a wildflower meadow. This is my own meadow uh, in summer. Um, I have an acre and two thirds of it is effectively my wild area. It's mostly wildflower area. And then at the side, there's a few trees and shrubs and my pond. The wildflower area I cut once a year in September. And then I take, I let the grass, the, the, the plants die and shed their seeds and then I rake it away a week later and put it in between the trees. So every year I cut it once and take it away. And in other words, it gets poorer and poorer the soil. And as a result, I get more and more flowers. The only thing I do in summer is cut path through it so I can have access to the wildflower uh, and it's a way of uh, enjoying it. And also it feels like I'm in control um, while nature is just really in control. The wildflower meadow for me has been a great uh, resource because it, it really is, um, yeah, every year I find new plants. Every year something else pops up that I didn't put in there, which is a fantastic thing. So the orchid on the left is the early purple flowering orchid, uh, orchid muscula, and it just popped up. And every year it flowers. Uh, I'm waiting for little ones to appear here and there, but it's so far been very reliable. Uh, on the right hand side, um, lots of cowslips. They love my garden and uh, they're popping up everywhere and buttercups. The wildflower area is really an area that is, um, is just alive with insects and it's relatively little work. So it's lovely to, uh, to have um, and to enjoy. What made the biggest impact in my wildflower area is the introduction of yellow rattle. Um, this is the flower of it. And these bulbous structures here are effectively uh, the seed pods. And when the seed is in there, it rattles, obviously. 
Uh, yellow rattle is an annual, it, so it has to seed itself every year and start again. But what is so good about yellow rattle is that it is a hemiparasite. So it is parasitic mainly on grass. And what it does is it, it grows its roots into the grass, it taps into the grass plant and sucks it dry effectively of water and nutrients. The plant itself is green, so it can photosynthesize. That's why we call it hemiparasitic. It still can photosynthesize, but it relies or it, it, it uses grass plants for its uh, water supply and nutrition supply. And as a result, the grasses are suffering. And as a result of that, you get more wildflowers because there's less competition with grass. So making the the whole soil poor helps to get biodiversity, but also introducing yellow rattle seriously helps uh, speed the process along. Yellow rattle is an annual, so it seeds itself. So it, it effectively runs around in my garden. Sometimes some areas have loads of it and other areas not, and next year it might be the other way around. So it is really an annual plant that finds its own way. Then at the end of the year, I cut my grass. Uh, in this case, I had help from my cousin, Marijn. Um, I have a scythe mower, which is effectively a big hedge trimmer uh, on, the, on the ground. And it cuts all the grass at the base. And uh, he loved doing that. He really chuffed with himself. And then um, this is my other cousin, uh, Giel. And um, it looks like a different day, <laughs> probably a week later when they were staying with me. And I always do, if they're there, uh, a competition of who makes the biggest haystack that gets them going. Uh, <laughs> and it's quite nice to do. And then once the hay is gone or dried, I'll put it in between the trees. So letting a bit of your grass go wild, it doesn't have to be your whole loan. It can be just a section. Uh, will make a big impact. Uh, you get flowers flowering in it, that looks good for the bees, and you get far more biodiversity. Another thing you can do is have a pond. This pond is in Giverny. This is Monet's garden in France, in Giverny. And I've been to it. It's a fantastic pond, I have to say. I can see that it was inspired to make the paintings. And I went there with a few colleagues and it was amazing how many people go there. It's very popular. So thousands of people go there, you queue to get into the garden. But once you come to the pond, you don't see anybody because the people are everywhere behind all this greenery and you don't see them. So you can walk around this whole pond and it's, it's almost as if you have it to yourself, despite thousands of people going there every day. It's quite amazing. Needless to say, most people don't have space for a pond like that. Um, here is a picture of my pond. Um, it, it's a bit obscure, but it's the end of my garden. So here is the wildflower meadow, a bit of it anyway. And here is this little hill that came out when I dug the pond, or the digger dug the pond for me when I got the land. Uh, I let them put the land here, the soil, and this is a little, little hilly with trees. And this is my pond. And when I put a pond in, straight away the birds arrived straight away the the then the, the um dragonflies all kinds of insects a pond is a magnet for wildlife and currently i have thousands of tadpoles in it they just hatched uh, it's just alive which is a fantastic things to do now i can imagine not everybody can have a massive pond in their garden but a small pond will help too so this is a lovely designed pond in, in, a, in an urban setting, I would guess. Um, it has water, a few marginals, and then a little beach where uh, animals can get in and out of the water, which is quite important. So anybody can put a little pond in and you get lots of enjoyment out of it, I can assure you. Other things you can do, birds nested, birds nests, uh, sunflowers for the bees and for yourself, needless to say, <laughs> bat boxes. Um, this is a very fancy one, the way it's designed. I made one based on a design on the web, very straightforward and square, and it's working. I got bats and they're in every year. They come and go. They, they In wintertime, they go to some cave in Carly, Carlo, and in the summer, they tend to come back. So these are things you can do. A few things you shouldn't be doing, 
and that is using chemicals. Um, I think personally, there is there shouldn't be any space for chemicals in a domestic garden. Um, there's one thing that farmers might need it to to produce crops, but in a domestic situation, you don't need to. And if your garden is very biodiverse, you tend to not to have problems with uh, other insects. I have never problems with insects in my garden because it's just a wash with insects and animals and different plants. And as a result, they keep each other in check. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. And the second one is um, keep invasive weeds out. Uh, the pictures here is one of Rhododendron ponticum and Japanese knotweed. Uh, different countries have different invasive weeds, uh, depends on their climate, of course. But in Ireland, these two are quite problematic. And if you allow those to grow, they hardly have any competition from other plants or insects or animals. And as a result, they grow and grow and grow. And in time, you have a monoculture of just those plants. And that is not good for biodiversity. So that's you do need to work on them to keep them out. For instance, in my pond, I uh, a few invasive pond weeds arrived, and I can never get them out. But I just always selectively take those weeds out and let the other pond plants uh, do their thing. And slowly but surely, uh, there is less of an invasive weed problem in my pond. And then I have to admit that the title of this talk, Dare to be Wild, doesn't come from me. Um, Mary Reynolds, and here she is, um, is a famous Irish garden designer who won uh, a Chelsea garden design gold. I, I don't have the year in my head, but a good, good few years ago. And she was a kind of rookie. She was new to the scene and she made a garden which was clearly very Celtic and very wild. And she won a gold, and that was quite amazing. And Mary has become very famous. And since then, she has made a film, and the film is called Dare to be Wild, or somebody made a film about her life, and it's called Dare to be Wild. And I thought it was quite suitable, because I think we should all let go a bit of uh, our control of the garden and let nature take a bit more control. She since then, she has uh, set up an organization called the ARC, and um, there is a website here. We are the ARC, effectively. Um, and what she is promoting is that, um, effectively, it's the corridor story that uh, weaving a patchwork of safe havens for nature globally, she thinks big, uh, in our gardens, schools, public spaces and beyond. So in other words, she is trying to make everybody um, go the whole way and do as much for biodiversity as possible. And she goes as far as it's saying that we're guardians rather than gardeners. She doesn't really want to garden anymore. She just wants to let go totally and let, uh, let the garden mind itself. Um, now, I don't fully, I'm, I'm not totally on her side. Um, you might think I am, but I'm not because I am a gardener. I love gardening. I can't help myself. Um, I go out the door and before I even hit the car, if I need to go anywhere, I've been weeding something on the way. It's just, it's in my genetics. And also I love plants and I need to try any plant to get my hands on. So as a result, I am constantly gardening. And um she goes a bit beyond that she feels you shouldn't be doing anything and she gives on the website a whole list of things that you can um that you should be doing and that's the pond and the, let the grassland go etc cetera, etc cetera. she suggests give half your garden back to nature i've done that remove the non-natives i've done that uh, create as many different habitats as possible i've done that too but the one thing she suggests I won't do is, she says, leave holes in your hedges so that animals can go from one side to the next. Um, and that's one thing I have a bit of a problem with because I got myself a COVID doggy, and here she is, Lucy. And I want to keep her, really. <laughs> so I'm doing my best to keep her in my garden. And so I do not want holes in my garden big enough for her to get out. 
birds and slugs and all kinds of small critters can come in, no problem, or get out, but she cannot. The other thing I think with Mary Reynold is that she um, she doesn't want to do any disturbance, but I think disturbance is natural. Um, you need some disturbance to create habitats, and Lucy for me is my Tamsworth pig effectively. She's doing all the disturbance in my garden because any dark bone she gets, she hides somewhere and then she digs it up five minutes later and hides it somewhere else. So she's doing a lot of digging and um, I just have to accept. Uh, I have to go with nature and let her do those things. Um, okay, another thing I, and that's the last thing I think, yeah, we're, we're good on time. Uh, another thing, I had to change in my own mind is my perception of what is nice. So it's a bit it's a bit like the the the, the syndrome that we're lowering our expectation what nature is. Um, we need to, I think, we need to start thinking differently about what is nice. And a good example for me is dandelions. As a as a gardener, dandelions are uh, awful because they always see themselves in between and underneath and everywhere. They're hard to get out and they always win. But since I've been teaching uh, beekeeping and biodiversity, um, I can see now that dandelions are very important for, for bees and for pollinators in general. And really they can become quite beautiful. And not only when they flower, uh, in my wildflower meadow I have loads, but also when they start producing their their seed heads, they are fantastic too. So I need to not think of messy areas as messy areas, but more as biodiverse areas. And all of a sudden it's not a problem anymore. And it's much easier than to take your hands off and let nature take control. Um, yeah. So these are the few things you can do. Um, I'm sure you can think of other things. There is a link here at the bottom that is Gardening for Biodiversity. It's a booklet made by County Leash. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, okay, Kenny, it says there, County Kilkenny. Um, and you can, you can get it and there's ideas in it. If you're looking for something to read while we're still in lockdown, um, I would recommend the book Wilding from Isabella Tree. That's what, um, what gave me the inspiration for all this work, all this talk. But also the book by um, Dave Golson, BeQuest. Um, Dave Golson is a lecturer in uh, the UK in a university, and he is a bee, a bumblebee specialist, really. And he wrote a few books on on his stories for his work, and he's an excellent storyteller. Um, but within all these stories there is excellent biodiversity information really interesting stuff really um, nice stories about positive things that can happen and um, so if you want something nice to read i would recommend any of those um, the to finish off the talk um, the nepa state started off with being uh, a normal conventional farm and then they went into becoming uh, a wildlife haven they are effectively a, a core location from where wildlife can then travel to other locations through corridors and the one thing that's missing and they always call it the three c's it's core corridors and carnivores is uh, carnivores because that's the last bit that's missing in order to have nature do its own thing but that's the one thing I'm not going to talk about here. That goes one step too far. Um, and with that, I think I want to thank you and finish here. Over to you, Glenn. Okay, Paul, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Okay. Very, very interesting. Um, I live in an apartment block and it just makes me more than ever want to get a piece of land and, and go and rewild it. It was, it was really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, we have a whole bunch of questions down below. Um, there's still time for anybody who wants to add questions or upvote some questions. So I'm going to go through that and fire them at Paul. Um, and we'll see how that goes. 
Um, so the first one has been upvoted, and uh, it's it's a serious <laughs> question, so I'm going to read it out because it's a long one. Um, so it says, it's brilliant, of course, to set up our own gardens for wildlife, and it's needed at the public scale too. I've seen floodplain specific rewilding or semi-rewilding in practice at places like the Blauwe Kamer in the Netherlands, where marginal land unsuitable for development was allowed flood in winter and grazed in summer. Given our history of land management, can we yet see a way forward for land, for, excuse me, for large scale rewilding of marginal land in Ireland for biodiversity, carbon storage and flood prevention? Oh, whoa. That's, that's, a, big that's <laughs> a very big one. Um, I think yes, is the short answer. Um, I, I think there is a, a change going on already in agriculture. Uh, there's lots of people now are beginning to change the way they produce food. We're producing way too much. We are overproducing. So we don't need all the land for food production. We just need to be a bit more clever about it. Um, and then I think all those marginal lands could be used to rewild, especially when you mentioned uh, the Blaue Kamer. I studied in Wageningen, so that's very close by. Um, it's um, Those kind of wetlands are extremely important and they have been neglected for a long time. And we now know that those wetlands are important for cleaning the water, filtering the water, slowing it down uh, and keeping the water table right. Um, and we need to reinstate them for our own health. Um, for, that's far more important, I think, than producing more food. But simultaneously, we need to be a bit more careful on not wasting food and uh, producing food in a more sustainable way. So I think that's a big yes. I okay. think we can do it. Super. Okay. Very good. Um, we're going to be hopping around for, for very wide questions and very specific questions. Um, there's a couple of inquiries about yellow rattle. Um, how much yellow rattle did you introduce and did you introduce it by seed or by plugs? I introduced it by seeds and um, how much I introduced, I don't know, but I do know that I introduced it. I sown seed, I had a little bag of seed and I sown it and then I didn't see it for a while. And then I thought, oh, I don't have it. And I, I had sown it again. I got another bird. And since then I've learned that yellow rattle needs a cold period to germinate. So it could well be that the seed was just sitting there and not germinating in the first year. It could also be that it germinated and I just didn't see it in between all the other plants. Uh, but all of a sudden, after a few years, I had yellow rattle everywhere. And since then, I've had it massively. So um, I would say have patience. Uh, look out for it, too. Uh, you might have it and not see it. Um, and I think that's the exciting thing about wildflower meadows or even a small wildflower areas. You'll find things there uh, that are very interesting botanically. So, yeah, I, I would say have a look um, and, and try it maybe a few times. Plugs is another way, but I have no idea where you can get plugs of yellow rattle. So. Very good. The the other yellow rattle question is kind of overlaps, but it's, it's also asking when is it when is a good when is the best time to plant it? Well, to sow it is in autumn because then it gets the, the, the cold. Um, to plant it, yeah, if you have plugs. Um, I was looking in my meadow just this morning. Are they up yet? And I haven't seen them yet. So I recognize the seedlings now when they come up. Um, I haven't seen them yet. But I would say if you, if you can get plugs, I would plant them next to grass uh, as soon as you have them, that they can start tapping into the grass and using them. Um, Okay, very good. Now, there's a few questions about NEP, but I might just leave them aside for a second because there's more, more generic questions. Um, what do you advise we can do with grass verges to help, to, excuse me, to use them to help with biodiversity? Yeah, I think grass verges, I, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about roadside verges, um, and I think they are, they could be so much better than they are. Um, I, when I studied in Wageningen, there was already a move to um, do effectively what I do in Mudflower Meadow with the verges. So cut them once a year and take away whatever has grown there and then let the grassland do its own thing. And that would create a massive corridor for wildlife and for plants as well. Um, and I think that would be very good. So I think verges are 
good. I, I, I think there's also an element of safety. You need to have perhaps a bit cut regularly be, because it might hang into the, into the road and then it becomes less safe. I can see that. But if they're wide enough, I would say leave an area uncut and cut it once a year. And that would be long term the best thing for biodiversity. OK, another couple of specific ones. Um, do you have any wild garlic plants? And if not, why? <laughs> um, um, do I have wild garlic? I don't. I do know that wild garlic can be very uh, dominant and quite um, um, invasive almost. So I was a bit reluctant to plant wild garlic in my area. I do know you can make lovely pesto from it. So <laughs> if I get it, I, it will get its chop for pesto making. Um, but I, I haven't got it yet. Yeah, very good. And I, I'm just going to throw in while while I'm at it, my colleague Kira here has, has made a little video recently about making uh, pesto from wild garlic. And you can find that on our on our Botanic Gardens YouTube site as well and on Excellent. our website. Uh, another question, Paul, can a very wet, mossy garden be turned into a wild garden? I think any garden can turn into a wild garden. If you have a very mossy, wet garden, it'll attract mossy, wet kind of creatures. <laughs> um, so, um, any garden can be can be a wildlife garden. There was a book produced. Oh God, I'm, I'm dreadful coming up with names. Um, the, the Dry Garden. It's 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 by um, some some woman in the UK, and she started promoting plants for dry gardens, and that's a different habitat, and it will attract animals that like a dry garden. And I would say it's the same for a wet, damp garden. You just have to get the plants that fit that area. Look in the native areas close by that might have plants that are well adapted for it and might take seed from that and, and introduce it uh, but any habitat can be is a habitat <laughs> is is useful okay yep sounds good uh, two questions you're going to take together about problematic insects i suppose um will wildflower meadows attract ticks and if so can can you plant anything to deter them and also just somebody asking about, uh, she has a load of green fly and any suggestions how to get rid of green fly. Okay, the green fly is easy. The tick one is not for me. I'm not a tick expert. Um, I, um, I, I haven't seen ticks in my wildflower meadow. Uh, ticks need, I think, other animals to survive. So they tend to be more in kind of forested areas where there is a bit of grass as well. And I think the ticks then come from, is it rabbits? And then sit on plants waiting for the next host, which could be us. Yeah. Um, so I don't think the wildflower meadow on its own is a risk. If it's close to a forested wild area, it might be. But I don't know too much about it. Okay. In relation to the aphids, aphid control, I think, is the easiest ever. Don't do anything. <laughs> um, people are tempted to spray as soon as they see aphids in spring. And aphids is, is a kind of core, um, a core animal for a lot of other animals to feed on. And their population starts to grow just before most other animals emerge. And so you always get a population of aphids in your roses in spring. And if you don't spray chemicals, then your biological control tends to just arrive. And by the middle of the summer, you won't have an aphid problem. That is providing the, 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 the plant is growing in the right, is growing okay. And there's an, enough different kind of plants in the area. I never have a problem with aphids in roses. And I see them in spring and I just tolerate them and ignore them and then they disappear. So, um, yeah, again, again, dare to go, dare to go wild, <laughs> let it go, <laughs> turn, turn a blind eye and, and ignore it. Very good. Uh, beavers. Um, now, I know Nep, you were talking about, Nep is in the UK, obviously. And this person is saying, my understanding is that beavers are not native to Ireland. Uh, where is the conversation in terms of the potential advantages or disadvantages of releasing non-native species? Um, now, I think beavers probably were native in Ireland at one point. Is that correct? I don't I don't know okay. is the answer okay. to this one. No. I don't know if they were native. And uh, introducing non-native species is always a risk. Um, and that has to be done very, very carefully. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of introducing non-native species uh, for biological control, because that was my 
previous live background. Uh, and we have been releasing, say, um, parasitic wasps that specifically parasitize a certain insect that's a problem. So, for instance, in Ireland, we had a problem of psyllids in eucalyptus trees. Eucalyptus trees were imported, obviously, from Australia, and they grow very well in Ireland for cut foliage. And they had a psyllid, uh, it's like a little aphid, effectively, uh, problem. And a wasp was introduced from Australia, effectively, and uh, and it, it wiped out, the, it, it, it made the problem go away. But it was introduced because the wasps can only multiply on that insect. They can cause problem in a wider environment. And that was really research before they did it. Introducing a beaver when it wasn't here originally could have major consequences. <laughs> and you have to be very careful before you do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before I take another question, Paul, I'm just going to highlight a comment by, by our colleague Nolene here, just talking about verges and, and what you just highlighted on non-native species, because we, we hear a lot these days about everybody is enthusiastic about uh, um, throwing wildflower seeds here, there and everywhere. But Nolene is just commenting as well that we uh, we need to be careful uh, that we uh, we don't sow wildflowers into road verges, but also that um, the wildflower seed that you sow is Irish in origin. Obviously, if you're in Ireland, it's wherever you are, you are that you use your own native right. seed, um, because it's 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 a bit of a trend these days, I suppose, that uh, we get we buy these packets of seeds and uh, we don't know if they're native or not. So it's 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 a good thing to uh, to to check that you are sowing native seeds. Yes. That's just that's just me highlighting my my, my colleague's comment there. Yeah, that's um, very good. Let me see what else we have. Um, we've got through quite a lot. Uh, grass verges. Okay, maybe I should go to the, the, the questions about NEP. There's a few. I might read a couple of them out at a time because uh, they're in, in the same area. <laughs> um, I think you covered this. Did the animals need care such as warming injuries and support for the young? And I, I think you said no, that they didn't get anything. No, I find it amazing. They said that the animals still have that native instinct and they eat plants whatever they need so in other words if they had shortage of iron they started eating nettles if they had a worm problem they started eating whatever another plant and that got rid of their worms seemingly they just know what they need and and sort themselves out and plus they're relatively wild so they're very sturdy they're not bred for production they're they're still relatively wild so they have all these faculty still there and i yeah i think that's a fantastic thing <laughs> yeah absolutely and i know you touched on this as well and i, I have a question to add to that as well uh, are there any concerns about one of the populations of the animals growing too big for the estate now i know you, you said that they were culling them um i i missed what you said was there any talk about introducing a predator such as wolves or something like that <laughs> no, it, 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 that discussion was going on in the Netherlands because in the Netherlands it was a major problem. So many animals died in winter and they weren't culling them. And the, the wolf had arrived in the Netherlands, the wild wolf, from via Germany. And some people were applauding it and some people didn't. Um, I, the wolf is not in the UK as far as I know, and I don't think they're going to introduce it. So they have solved the problem by culling and selling the meat as organic meat. And they did acknowledge after seeing it in Holland that you cannot let the uh, the, the roaming deer and uh, cattle numbers go up too much because that will be detrimental for biodiversity. So that's the one thing that they do do as an intervention. Okay, super. Uh, we're nearly done. Um... Just a couple about rewilding as well. Uh, this person says, I have a half acre of land starting to rewild. It's very wet at one end and want to make a natural rain pond. Any suggestions? If you hold that for one second, because I think there's another one, uh, also says, is it expensive making a large pond and how do you do it? Now, that's probably a, a whole extra lecture, but I'll give that one for you. Okay. Um, okay. On the pond side of things, what I did... Um, Oh, I, I don't have it here with me now. I I have a kind of sandy soil, so I had to put a liner in. Um, I just bought a, a proper beauty liner. Uh, that probably was a thousand euro. I don't remember. It's now 15, 16 years ago. Um, but I put in a proper one because then even if the edges are exposed, it, the, the sun won't disintegrate the rubber and it's still working for me. Um, 
and I had a digger in for half an hour to dig the hole. That's about it. So there is a bit of cost involved, but then that's it. Uh, and I have it now for 15 years. The other question, I tried to remember, it was about wetland and then and then what? Um, I think it was just bear, bear with me. Uh, I think the garden was wet down one end. Hold on. Oh, mm -hmm. I've lost my question. Have half acre of land starting to rewild, very wet at one end and want to make a natural rain pond. Any suggestions? OK, yeah. Again, if you have a clay soil, you can, you might be able to make a, a pond at the end at the wet area by um, digging a hole. And then I think you smear the, the, the clay. Uh, you, you, you roll in the clay several times up and down into the area and then effectively it seals it. And if it then fills with water, the clay will expand and seal it even more. So if you have a real clay soil, you might do without uh, a liner. Um, but if it's not that uh, clay, then you might need a liner if you want to create a pond in a wet area. But from the sound of it, if you have a, a garden that is naturally wet on one side, uh, that is probably a, a natural place to have a pond. So it will probably look OK. So, yeah, yeah good, like it. good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, one more, which is kind of interesting. Um, is it possible to reintroduce barn owls by breeding them in can activity and releasing them into the locality. Um, do you grow crops that could encourage mice as a food source for winters? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I know nothing about barn owls, so I have to let that one go. Perhaps, Glenn, you can answer because I think you know more about birds than I do by far. Uh, and grow stuff for mice, I would think any grass, any anything that produces seed will do. Um, so I don't think that's a problem if you if you rewild, there will be mice, um, but the barn owls, I let go. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not going. I don't feel qualified enough to add to that either. Um, I, I, mm. I would love to see more barn owls around, and if there is oh, a yeah. way of, of growing to encourage them, it would be fantastic. Um, what, what, what I've, what I've learned from, from, um, Nep is as well that, if you rewild to the scale that they do, things start to appear so they have all the owls that exist in the uk in nep they all arrived and they're multiplying uh, to a high extent okay and there's one owl one owl there it's a small owl i've forgotten the name of it and it lives off dung beetles and because the the animals aren't been been dewormed and chemically treated the the dung is hosting hundreds of different beetles. And as a result, the owl is now, see, this is a typical example of then it cascades and you get this whole uh, range of things. So perhaps, I don't know who this question comes from and where this person lives, but perhaps if you create the right environment, the animals will come. Yeah, build it and they will come as they say. Yeah. Okay, Paul, I, I think I'm, we're running out of questions. We had quite a lot and we've just hit four o'clock. So unless anybody else has something really pressing to ask, we might think about letting Paul go. I, I was fascinated by that talk, and I, I think everybody, from looking at the comments, I think people are really interested in it. It makes mm -hmm. me, as I say, want to go and get a piece of land somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if nobody else has any anything else, I'm going to thank you very much for, for coming and talking for us, and um, we'll see you soon. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining in. If we've missed any questions, we might look through the list of questions, and we, we'll, uh, we'll push them onto Paul later, and we'll see if we can get a bit more time out of him. <laughs> There we go. Thank, so you, thank you very much. And it's lovely to see all the comments on the site. It's great. So thank you. And thank you, Glenn, for organizing it. Okay. And just a reminder, everybody, uh, if you want to see this, this has been automatically recorded. You can just go straight back into the link that you got here and you can, you can uh, access the recording as soon as we're finished here. And on that point, I'm going to wrap up. So thank you, everybody. Take care. We might see you next week for our next talk. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, Paul. Bye.